Good morning or good afternoon to some people. I'm Sanford Unger, Director of the Free Speech Project at Georgetown University in Washington, DC, and happy to welcome you to this program, special program that we set up on relatively short notice today to talk about something that very many people around the country and the world have been talking about, the uh, slap at the Oscars ceremony about 10 days ago by Will Smith of Chris Rock, who was uh, preparing to give an award at the time. Uh, I think many people know uh, the, the details of it. We have an excellent panel assembled today. We're very grateful to them for taking the time to be with us. Uh, and Nadine Strosen, who uh, is uh, one of the leading theoreticians and speakers about free speech in the country. She teaches at the New York Law School and is its former dean. She was for uh, almost two decades the uh, president of the American Civil Liberties Union, beginning obviously when she was a very young child and uh, has established a great reputation on these issues. Also Randall Kennedy, an eminent professor of law at Harvard Law School, was written about many free speech and, and related issues and published books that have attracted a great deal of attention. And uh, we're very grateful to, to Randall for being able to take the time today, as well as Issa Ulen, who is a freelance journalist and also teaches at Hunter College and Baruch College in New York City and recently published an article in The Hollywood Reporter to, uh, to discuss some of the issues that that occurred to her as a result of this incident. Um, I, I'd, I'd like to plunge right in and ask really, uh, some people, you know, this, this, is, this has already been examined from so many perspectives, but not that I've seen from the free speech perspective that uh, our project at Georgetown is so involved with. And, and I, I'd like to start by asking Nadine, uh, there's, there's not, necessarily an issue of the First Amendment here. We all know that it's not an issue of the government trying to restrain speech, but it's a First Amendment values and the values that we all, or I, I think most people agree who are probably tuned in that we'd like to preserve and protect these values. Before Nadine answers my question, I do want to note that the chat is disabled on your screens for this program. But if you do have questions or issues that you'd like to be addressed, use the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen. And time permitting, I will come to those and, and present them to the panelists as well. But Nadine, uh, where is the free speech issue here in your view? Uh, was Chris Rock's speech protected? Was uh, uh, Will Smith's speech, if symbolic or brief, also protected. Well, thank you so much, Sandy, for including me with such wonderful co-panelists as Randy and Issa. And I actually have been hearing a lot of commentary and questions and indeed assertions uh, often to the effect that, well, of course, Chris Rock didn't have the right to say that. Uh, and again, people uh, putting aside the fact that we are not talking about the First Amendment, but the values of free speech that infuse the First Amendment, uh, his speech was protected, even if it is regarded as, indeed, even if it, it was intended to be insulting. The two possible uh, exceptions that have been asserted by people who are shocked to find that um, his speech would be protected um, are number one, the so-called fighting words exception. This goes back to an old 1942 case in which the Supreme Court said uh, that words which by their very utterance uh, insult 
injure somebody's feelings uh, can be punished as unprotected fighting words. In the many, many decades since then, back then in 1942, the Supreme Court hadn't seriously begun to protect free speech. I think it's important to note it has never again upheld a so-called fighting words um, conviction, but it has narrowed the definition so that something could be considered punishable fighting words, but in appropriately narrow circumstances. When the speaker is targeting a particular individual and intentionally saying insulting words that are provocative of or inviting to a fight. Uh, the Supreme Court uses this quaint phrase, an invitation to fisticuffs uh, seems to go back to the dueling age, right? And the standard is judged by a reasonable person. That it's, it's an objective standard, not a subjective one. So it doesn't matter if Will Smith is uh, unusually thin skinned, uh, it would not be fighting words and hence unprotected unless a reasonable person in that position uh, would respond with violence. And I think that standard is not satisfied in this situation appropriately. Uh, we are expected to control our emotions and to express them either verbally or non-verbally, but not through physical violence. So um, then did you ask the question about the slap itself? Now, the fact that it is conduct and not, you know, pure verbal speech is not germane. I think people know that many kinds of provocative conduct, such as burning an American flag, uh, have been appropriately deemed to be protected speech. But what the the relevant question is, is the um, is 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 the conduct it, it, with the punishment in this case any kind of censure or other punishment that might be meted out by the academy? Uh, is it targeting the idea that was behind the slap? In which case that would be suspect. That would create free speech problems. Or rather, is it a viewpoint neutral? Uh, punishment or sanctioning of the conduct aspect. And I think it is the latter. Surely if Will Smith had, uh, had smacked Chris Rock or slapped Chris Rock for any reason, even to convey exactly the opposite message, uh, it would be the physical action itself that was earning the sanction and not the message that was conveyed. In other words, the non-expressive aspect of the expressive conduct, and therefore it is subject to punishment consistent with free expression values. Let me ask our other panelists if they agree with Nadine on that particular point of the uh, pure speech protection of both Chris Rock, well, of Chris Rock, but not Will Smith in, in her view. Professor Kennedy? Yeah, I, I agree with uh, practically everything that uh, Nadine just said. On the question of, you know, is this, a, is this a free speech matter? Sure, it's a free speech matter. I mean, here we have a person who makes a joke. And by the way, let's stipulate that it was a bad joke. Let's stipulate that it was an insulting joke. Let's stipulate that it was uh, an offensive joke. Uh, but the joke was made and the question is uh, when somebody says something that is offensive, that's absolutely horrible, how should we, um, how should people respond? Now the response that this joke got was physical retaliation, violence. Well, um, question, should we draw a line around that? Should we say that under no circumstances are we going to allow it? It seems to me that the answer should be no, we're not gonna allow it. That, that that becomes a very bright line that marks what should be deemed censorship. Now, um, you then ask the question, you know, no, this is not, the case that we have right before us is not a First Amendment case, though it could become a First Amendment case. Let me change it around a little bit. Let's imagine that instead of slapping uh, Chris Rock, 
let's imagine that the violence had been greater than that. Let's imagine that a baseball bat had been brought and the and he and uh, and Will Smith had actually hit Chris Rock with a baseball bat and had seriously injured him. And then let's also suppose that uh, no charges were were brought because let's say that the officials were on the side of Will Smith. They, you know, let's imagine that an official said, "Well, he had that. That's what was coming to him." It would seem under those circumstances that we would have a situation where the state was rendering under protection. The state was actually not willing to come forward and protect Chris Rock because the state didn't like what Chris Rock said. It seems to me that that would be uh, a big First Amendment uh, problem. And it's a type of, it's a First Amendment problem that we see all over the United States. And it's a real, you know, that's a real difficulty. We should demand, we should demand that people practice self-discipline even in the face of statements, of uh, symbols, of jokes that are terrible, that are offensive, that are horrific. Issa, how do you how do you feel about this? I agree. I think that it's important that we maintain a level of civility, uh, particularly um, in the public realm, and that Chris Rock's speech, uh, his joke, as offensive as it was and as problematic as it was, um, because that speech is protected and he had the freedom to make that joke, he's opened up an opportunity for us to amplify the problematic aspects of what was said. That becomes compromised, and so I agree with Randall Kennedy and Nadine Strasser, that be Strassen, sorry, that becomes um, complicated when you throw into this mix Will Smith's physical response, the slap itself. That should not have happened. Um, I think that it had Will Smith used his platform to respond to the joke, that that would have enhanced the conversation. And that's what I'm really interested in. What is the public discourse around Black women, protecting Black women, Black women's appearance, and Black women in hair? Um, so as offended as I was by that speech, uh, by that joke, as difficult as it was for me to hear, um, Will Smith's response was even more problematic to me. I'm glad that that joke was protected. He was given the freedom and the platform to make it because now we can have a free and open discourse and really uh, interrogate the cultural permission that Chris Rock believed that he had to denigrate Jada Pinkett Smith in that way. May I comment, uh, Sandy? Because sure, both, yeah. both of my co-panelists have made such generative remarks. Um, Ida is basically saying, to use the, the, the lawyer's term, that the counter speech in which uh, Will Smith engaged was not only not uh, consistent with free speech values, but it was actually ineffective and counterproductive in achieving the substantive result of, of conveying his views in a way that would inform and, and lead to uh, a more vigorous and robust and critical conversation. And Randy raises the really important point that um, there is some complicity on the part of um, institutional actors ranging from uh, police officers to uh, to campus officials to, in this case, potentially the academy, although it did step in, those who are in a position to sanction uh, physical threats or violence that interrupt the conversation. And, uh, you know, we saw this in the civil rights movement uh, when exactly police officers refused to protect demonstrators against violence. And the Supreme Court called that a heckler's veto. We see that today on college campuses, dare I say, including yours, Sandy, where uh, there is a wonderful speech um, statute or regulation in protection, but it's not enforced when people violated. So um, the authorities become complicit in undermining the conversation as well as free speech. I, I have two questions. One is sort of a small one and then a big one. 
Uh, does it make any difference to all your considerations, and this may just require one or two word answer, I don't know, it, that Chris Rock was there as a comedian? Would it have been, would your interpretation be different if he'd been giving a substantive talk in a different place, or if, if he had simply issued a criticism that seemed unjustified or inappropriate, uh, unkind to Will Smith's wife. Would that make any difference at all? Not to me. Not to, to me. me. <laughs> to me, does it make a difference? I suppose in judging the overall situation that he is a comedian actually makes the violence against him to me, um, less uh, justifiable. He's a comedian. I mean, again, it, you know, it might have been a terrible joke. It might have been an unfunny joke. It might have been cruel, but he's a comedian. And it, it seems to me that, you know, one of the things that folks ought to think about or ought to be thinking about is, I mean, so what next? I mean, you know, comedians are all over the place in the United States. You go you know, and, and they often push the envelope. They often say things that frankly are mean. Uh, if we're going to allow people to respond violently against comedians, gosh, uh, th that would be a really terrible uh, new, uh, you know, uh, a, a, a new avenue of, uh, of, of problem with respect to freedom of expression. Some people may have the misapprehension that uh, that's exactly the opposite, that, well, it's only comedy as opposed to serious political discourse. And um, some serious constitutional scholars, most importantly, Robert Bork, actually made that argument that if it's only art or, you know, not about politics, it shouldn't be protected speech. But the Supreme Court long ago rejected that distinction correctly. Issa, does it make a difference to you? It doesn't make a difference to me. I will say from the uh, sort of cultural worker uh, perspective, we need to remember that comedy is the brutal art. Um, comedy hurts, good comedy is painful. Um, and that's what I try to examine in that Hollywood Reporter article that you referenced, Sandy, um, that there was a lot of pain on all three sides in that encounter. And I think it opens up an opportunity for us to engage in a free and open discourse about that pain, to unpack those layers of meaning. Um, certainly the, the performance of a kind of robust civil discourse has become an issue for me. Uh, where people are engaging in conversations in the public realm um, that don't have jokes that aren't being told by comedians, um, but don't sort of <laughs> the weaponization of words, right? right? Where words are being used in targeted ways as micro invalidations, as microaggressions that are violent and harmful. And I think that we have to be careful in the way that we, and again, I'm going to use this term, give people cultural permission um, to speak in ways that are triggering, that are painful. But the only way that we can get to a more restorative place in the way that we think about speech and protecting it and protecting the humans that are sometimes hurt when words are weaponized is to have these frank and open public conversations from multiple points of view. And that's what's important to me. Lisa, I love that phrase that you used when you said comedy is a brutal art. That is so eloquent and it really, it's a double-edged sword in the sense, last night I happened to have dinner with a professional stand-up comic, a black woman, one of the pioneers um, uh, uh, in her demographic group. And she, we were talking from her perspective uh, that stand-up comedy is you make yourself more vulnerable than in any other a way that we can imagine, even speaking constantly in a non-comic way, because uh, I don't have those talents. And in some ways, you know, it is br brutal 
to the comic as well, who no doubt often is receiving very uh, mean and harsh and unfair criticism of the nonviolent sort, but still deeply painful. And maybe it's like it epitomizes from both perspectives, the robust discourse that, that all of us should be engaging in, as you so wisely say, but it's especially intense when it's uh, the comic and the person who's being insulted by the comic. Yeah. Can Something I ask ran... of Issa? I'm sorry, go ahead. Issa, you, in, your, in, your, in your remarks, which I agree were, were, were you know, um, quite striking, you, you did have a, you used a phrase, you talked about when words are weaponized. And I wanted to ask you about that. Aren't words always weaponized? I mean, if, if I'm writing an article, I'm going to try to make it as vivid, as punchy, as powerful as, as I can. You know, now, aren't I, in, in doing that, can't, it could be said, can't it, that I'm weaponizing words. Aren't words, in a sense, always weaponized? I suppose that you could make the case for that. Um, what I mean in particular is, you know, we've been talking about this Oscar, you know, this amplified voiced expression, this global reach. You know, I'm thinking also about what happens in quieter spaces and spaces where there aren't a lot of cameras, where there aren't any microphones. Mm -hmm. And I think that there's an intentionality to provoke to violence. There's an intentionality to provoke to a kind of erasure that has gained momentum in our everyday discourses that I find troubling. And so that the intention isn't to get a laugh right? And the intention isn't to start a conversation, to hear the other point of view, to unpack really difficult or challenging topics of conversation, or to try to contribute to the public discourse or the private discourse for that matter, in a meaningful way. There is a thing called fighting words. And um, I think that these micro invalidations, these microaggressions that have been used are a little bit different or qualitatively different in terms of how they're received by me. For example, if a woman or man for that matter, or a non-binary person uh, who is not African-American wanted to have a real conversation about black women in here with me following this uh, event, I would be open to that conversation, right? And I would want to engage in that person's um, questions and queries, assuming that this person is coming from a place of really wanting to talk, really wanting to actively listen and really wanting to learn and that we might not land on the same place. This might end up being a source of even more tension, right, in the moment, but that ultimately it leads to a more robust public discourse because we both come in as good faith actors. There are people who are intentionally going in on people uh, in a way that is intended to malign, to hurt, um, in a very public facing way. And that to me is qualitatively different in the way that it lands, in the way that it is felt, and in terms of intentionality, where it, it derives from, right? My assumption is that the intent is to invalidate, it is to erase, it is to silence, it is to further concretize this hegemony that uh, the person is privileged to land somewhere near the top of. Um, and the concretization of those uh, social forces, the concretization of that hegemony is problematic. That's not a person who's looking to, you know, engage in a rich and meaningful conversation. That's a person who's intending to wield their power over me and people who look like me. And that is something that is feels qualitatively different. That's what I mean by weaponization. I may say, I, so. that's in, although in a different factual context, that to me is a brilliant 
explanation of the concept of cancel culture where you know, the term itself means nothing, but where the point is not to criticize somebody's ideas, hold them accountable for the ideas, but to punish them and erase them as human beings. And I thought it was very interesting the most recent survey that I saw about uh, students uh, chilling a free speech on campus, students who feel uncomfortable voicing their opinions on important topics such as race and gender, Everybody says they're engaging in self-censorship, but two groups of students in particular said they were chilled more than others. One was uh, black students and one was conservative students. And I think, you know, we've, we've seen the reason why. I think Issa described it with respect to black people, but conservatives are saying pretty much the same thing. You know, you're going beyond, you don't really don't want to well, talk about this. It, it's perhaps not your main now, Nadine, but I think there are other it reaches across those divides. There are other groups who, who would contest the, especially that conservative speech is unique in being suppressed. But I, but that's beyond our, 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 our mandate today. I want to raise something that is related to to something Randy said a few minutes ago. The uh, another black comedian, Dave Chappelle, finds himself in tremendous difficulty with his audience at the moment because of a comedy spec he did on, on Comedy Central or something as special, in which he particularly took out after transgender people. And there's been, uh, you know, uh, certain people said, all in good fun, can't you take a joke? But there have been a lot of people, including his own high school in Washington, DC, the Duke Ellington School for the Arts, which have rejected him. Now, nobody has slapped him, as far as I know, or, or engaged in violence against him. But he in turn has reacted with great anger and, and uh, sort of challenged the right of people to challenge his mm -hmm. comedic expression, even though it was deeply hurtful to many people. And they, they explained why it was hurtful and they, 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 the petitions were signed and it's, it's a huge. So it's, it's everything that, happened here only worse without the slap without without the physical intervention and i think although there are other areas i want to get to i think given where this conversation has gone i'm interested if anybody has some thoughts about whether dave chappelle is in a situation like chris rock even though there's been no violence against him or whether the uh critics are in a situation like that of Will Smith in this case? Have they gone too far? Is there a line? Is there a limit to what they either party can say? There is a limit. And I, it seems to me that they are put in very different positions. Um, on the question of cancel culture, uh, I, I, I think I might be in some tension here with Nadine. Because in my view, um, you know, people who are engaged in canceling, it can be said about somebody who's canceling, they are expressing themselves. So for instance, if let's imagine that after Chris Morak made his joke, let's imagine that Will Smith, upon getting the stage had said, this was a terrible joke, this was a demeaning joke. It was a cruel joke. And I'm asking everybody in TV land, I'm asking everybody listening to my voice, cancel Chris Rock until he apologizes. Would that be wrong? No, it's, as far as I'm concerned, that would not be wrong. Now, you know, somebody might say, well, I mean, that's cancel culture. Cancel culture, canceling is its own sort of expression. And I would say that with respect to boycotts. I would say that with respect to, you know, uh, you know, uh, putting people off your whatever feed you're on. So, you know, I, I think we, with respect to Dave Chappelle, Dave Chappelle had his say. Fine. He had his say. Now other people are having their say. Now, you, you know, are they censoring him as far as I'm concerned? No, they're not censoring him. They are simply having their say. We're, we're talking about a political struggle. 
and people will have to make up their minds about who they think is right or wrong. But it seems to me it's, 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 not, it's not a matter of censorship when people you raise their voices to object to other voices that they don't like for some reason. I so it's just a, it's the physical gesture here that is, that is what sets it apart. Yes, in my view. But I think what I'm saying, and as I understood Issa to say, we're not advocating any kind of uh, punishment. We're not saying that it is not, you know, you, of course you have a free speech right to say hurtful things about black women and to say hurtful things about black male comics who are saying hurtful things about black women. But the question is to create the kind of dialogue and discussion and discourse uh, that that Issa, Issa was talking about to have uh, the kind kind of discussions that I think are really necessary, not only for individual liberty, but for our democratic republic, we have to strive to create a culture that does not disproportionately punish somebody for saying something offensive because the, of the enormous chilling impact that has. And therefore that those of us who are seeking not only to defend free speech rights in the abstract, but to nurture discourse and to bridge polarization, that we should say, yes, you have a right to, uh, to boycott, but we urge you not to go that far in this case. Or yes, you have a right private sector employer to fire somebody for an offensive of tweet that they posted on social media, but we urge you not to do that because we think the end result uh, for both free speech and civil discourse and democracy are negative. I agree with Nadine, that. with with respect, you're urging a tolerance and a and a softness mm -hmm. uh, and a reasonableness at a time when this society is so polarized and when nothing seems to be reacted to in a moderate or or even transitional manner. And so one of the questions that has been troubling me about all, all this, there, there's a kind of, um, if you excuse this expression, a sort of mock shock that someone in the, in the role, in the place, in, in the exalted position in many respects of Will Smith would slap somebody. This in a country where the president of the United States, the, the, sitting president of the United States uh, a year and a quarter ago, um, condoned and many people believe fomented an insurrection against the heart of government, violence of an extraordinary nature, a, a gallows built outside, uh, people died. Uh, and now uh, many key Republican politicians, I, we can leave out the word Republican, uh, but um, uh, are saying this was legitimate political expression. So I think some people would have to say, wait a minute, this slap was really a terrible transgression. And yet uh, a party that seems to represent half of the American public says it was legitimate political discussion to invade the Capitol and and, and look for people they wanted to put into a gallows, whether it was metaphorical or, or, or actual, and, and who have been convicted in federal court, many of these people of, of truly violent acts. I mean, is, is there not some sort of dis... Here. Discussions about free speech and censorship are nothing if not constantly hypocritical. And of course. Consistent. You know, the best phrase is freedom of speech for me, but not for thee. Um, exactly. It's a complete uh, result orientation. Uh, if I like what you're saying, I'm going to call it free speech. If I don't, I'm going to call it violence. But but how do, how do we credit um, this outrage over the slap? If some of the, I don't know whether there's some of the same people, but there are, there are certainly a lot of people who condone much more severe violence in the name of speech. So what, what sort of dilemma does that put us in, Randy? I don't think it's much of a dilemma. I think it's just terrible. Uh, I think you're right to draw attention to the, the specter 
of January 6th. And, uh, you know, again, we are living in a perilous moment in which people are not being attentive enough to boundaries. And here, I guess, I, I, I'd like to um, uh, underline and just completely agree with uh, uh, Isha, Isa and Nadine, because in their comments, both of their comments, their, their point was, it's not enough to talk only about rights. You know, rights are important, that's, that's very important, but it seemed to me that the central point of their comments had to do with what kind of overall culture do we want to create? Don't we want to have a culture in which we're not just concerned about rights, what you can do, but we're also, con we're, we're even more concerned with what sort of environment will, um, will, will nurture, uh, you know, goodness and good citizenship? And what sort of culture will, uh, will, will enable, enable to speak and speak candidly? It seems to me that that is the, the, the larger task uh, ahead of us. And getting back to the slap, when you engage in you know, a physical retaliation, uh, that is going to undermine all of what uh, my, my co-panelists have been urging. One last point, I do think, because you know, everybody is, I think you know, in the, on this session has been very critical and I think appropriately so of, um, of Will Smith. It, it, it is worth mentioning that he has, and from what I can tell, uh, sincerely uh, apologized. And, you know, um, we ought to worry about, again, in, you know, in terms of trying to create the sort of society we want, we don't want to be hyper punitive. Uh, a person can mess up, all of us do. And you know, it's not the end of their. It's not the end of their life. It shouldn't be the end of their life. We should allow people to come back once they've, you know, sincerely apologized. And it seems to me that he has sincerely apologized. And to that extent, okay, let's all learn from this, and you know, try to tr try to move on up a little higher in light of what we've learned. Thank you for I saying agree. that, Brittany, because all of this, if we're going to be consistent, we should be as um, potentially forgiving of, uh, of Will Smith as of Chris Rock and of Dave Chappelle. And I always find it so, uh, you know, yet another inconsistency in our culture being so hyper punitive toward words, or in this case, potentially the slap. Um, whereas we are fortunately, after many years of crusading for it myself and through the ACLU, um, really embracing the concept of so-called restorative justice more broadly, where you have even conservatives and Republicans and law enforcement officials wanting to ratchet down the overly harsh punitive um, a a treatment in the criminal legal system even toward people who have committed violent crime, even homicide, we're saying, you know, as Brian Stevenson famously says, you're not reduced to the worst thing you've ever done. So you certainly shouldn't be reduced to the, the most offensive or microaggression or even deliberately insulting remark that you've ever made. I think- Issa, I wonder how you, I'm sorry. That's okay. Issa, Issa um, yeah. As Randy reminds us, Chris Rock began apologizing, what, 20 minutes later or half an hour later. And I, I'm sorry, Will Smith, Smith began apologizing 20 minutes later. And uh, we're told now that the Academy is going, has moved up its hearing or its investigation, its considering to tomorrow. And, and I wonder, um, What's left to do to Will Smith after all these comments have been made, after he's apologized? Is it his humiliation? Is it his complete 
ruin. People are saying future projects are threatened. Now, I understand some of that is the response of the marketplace and in a society and a culture like this, we have to expect a response from the marketplace. But isn't it, as Nadine, I think is suggesting, time to move on, learn our lessons and, and, and let the, the offender have a little peace and quiet to, to move on himself? My understanding of restorative justice is that it requires a bit more rigor than that. And it also requires a buy-in on the part of all parties involved. So you can't be sort of punitively dragged to the restorative justice table, right? You have to willingly accept this opportunity to deviate from the punitive practices that really can be more harmful than helpful and engage one another from opposite sides of whatever issue might be going on um, in meaningful ways. And that level of rigor, and I'm sorry, you might hear New York City outside my window in a siren is going by. It seems like a <laughs> staged background for what you're saying. <laughs> it's New York City for sure. Um, so um, I would, in this moment that we find ourselves in, America is at this precipice and we have to figure out who the heck we are. Are we dynamic and inclusive and beautiful and wonderful and strong and welcoming? Or are we a bunch of jerks who can't actively listen to one another? And I think in this great reckoning, the academy actually has a great opportunity. Let's interrogate the policies, systems, and guidelines that have been in place and use this as an opportunity to engage in a restorative way. I don't know Chris Rock. I have not been able to text him because I don't know him. But I think he might be more inclined to something that is restorative for both he and for Will Smith and for Jada Pinkett Smith. I think that there can be accountability in a way that does not, as you were saying, Sandy, uh, negate or abnegate all of the good work and all of the joy that Will Smith and all of the frivolity and, and fun that it has been Will Smith's job for all these decades and that he has delivered to us. Um, I think that uh, in terms of cancel culture, that again, with the uh, Dave Chappelle uh, example that you brought up, you have a marginalized group you know, trans people in America who amplified their voices by coming together and said to an African-American male, another marginalized group, regardless of how much money he makes from his show or whatever, still an African-American man in America, and, and say, you know, we have a problem with what you just said. And I think, again, if we can sort of reconfigure or, or recenter, reframe who we are as Americans and use these points of tension as opportunities in this moment to come together in restorative ways. Chris Rock and the trans community might learn something from each other. And there are guidelines for this. Uh, Fania Davis is doing a lot of work in the area of restorative justice at the national level. You've got small groups in you know, places like Boston who were coming together using truth and reconciliation, led by Bishop Desmond Tutu at the end of the apartheid era as a framework to talk about hot button issues like abortion rights and abortion access in the United States. So people have created a framework and a model for going to the difficult places. Just wanna say one more thing. And I have to say this as an educator. I think that, and this is outside the parameters of the discussion, but I need to state this. I think that we have failed our children in diminishing, reducing opportunities for them to engage in the kind of robust discourses that we want to see at the national level in their classrooms. We have been over testing them, forcing them to fill in bubbles and to get the right answer. And in doing so, I think have really reduced the capacity of everyday Americans to have the level of rigorous discourse that we are all calling for. So I think this is a big moment 
and a big opportunity for us to again reframe and re-deliver the kind of learning that's required for effective and robust restorative justice and to interrogate again systems and policies and institutions like the board of governors right with the academy and to begin to unpack and surface ways of coming together that will reduce the again i'm going to use this term cultural permission that people felt they had to invade the Capitol on January 6th. We've got to move away from the idea that violence is in some way um, an, a, 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 a legal or a, a, an acceptable a justifiable response. Means, yeah. An acceptable or justifiable response. I think that was completely relevant, Issa. Thank you so much. You make me think of uh, a great opinion relevant actually to what we're talking about, uh, Justice Harlan, uh, which involved a jacket during the Vietnam War era that said, fuck the draft. And, you know, he started rather defensively saying, you know, some people may think this is, you know, a trivial case that involves a word that was then considered as taboo as some racial epithets are today. And he said, but you have to understand that this is a microcosm of the largest issues that are affecting both individual and society. And I think, thank you so much, because you really explained the importance of an incident, which some people may think is getting disproportionate attention because it happened to involve celebrities. But it really, and, and, and Sandy, the one questions that you posed and the comments that, that Randy and Isa have made have shown that this is really involving not only huge problems such as the insurrection, but also big but painstaking solutions, starting with education of our kids at the youngest ages. By the way, in the Q&A channel that we opened up for people listening to participating in this program, there are people asking, why doesn't the local prosecutor prosecute Will Smith? He's got plenty of witnesses. He or she has plenty of witnesses, plenty of opportunity. Uh, Chris Rock doesn't have to endorse that, that prosecution. It doesn't matter necessarily what the victim believes in the mind of the, the prosecutor. So there are a lot of people who are, and, and I like to think that the people who tune into our our programs and our presentations are reasonable, intelligent, well-educated people. There are people saying a, a point needs to be made and, and uh, punishment needs to be enacted by the civil authorities, by the state, as you as you suggested earlier. I'd like to ask Randall. Randy about that, because, I mean, did you see that it was a clear distinction or at least you know, I know it's a matter of judgment that prosecution would have, arrest would have been more warranted if a baseball bat had been involved than just the slap? So I, I, I think it's a, it's a good question. What I've read is that the uh, infraction that would have been most plausible given the circumstances would under California law be a misdemeanor and that sort of infraction would require uh, the victim of the violence uh -huh. press charges. And when, uh, when Chris Rock refused, declined to press charges, the state was disabled from actually going forward. At least that's what I've read. Uh, we're, we're winding down a little bit and I, I want to pick up on something that Issa said I mean, first of all, I continue to be amazed how many people <clears throat> of all the issues confronting us at the moment have grabbed onto this as an emblematic and important issue. And so are there other ways, do you think, that we can, we as a society, can use this debate, this moment to, I don't know, define uh, some sort of, I hate to use the word rules, but conditions for, for cultural interactions, which are apparently quite significant to people, like maybe, the Academy maybe Awards. Norms. Sandy, maybe norms rather than rules? Well, norms, norms yes, or, or some, some guidelines. Some, 
is there is there some process? Certainly, the government is not going to and cannot, as far as I can, would see at the moment, the government's not going to pick this up. Is it is it an opportunity for some foundations or cultural institutions or something to to try to pull us out of this incident into a space where we could talk about how to prevent this kind of thing from happening? How to how to yes go to restorative model, but also um, a conversation model, of not not to over overemphasize what we are doing, but but to to get people talking about this in a way that has a positive result. Yeah, I think that's so important, and um, I think that the sort of hypocritical pearl clutching around the event is something that also needs to be interrogated. Um, this wasn't the first act of violence at the Academy Awards. It was the first oh. on stage on air slap. But I'm thinking of Sashin Littlefeather, who refused to accept Marlon Brando's, I think, 1972 Oscar. She delivered a speech about the representation of Native Americans in film and about the, at that time, uh, I think it was about a month long occupation of Wounded Knee um, and was booed, which you could say, well, that's protected also um, and applauded by some, but um, apparently Mar uh, 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 John Wayne was in the wings backstage and had to be restrained by several men um, because he wanted to go on stage and forcibly remove her even as she was speaking within the confines of her 60 second uh, speech. Um, and so I think that we need to unpack this violence and um, really begin to think about creating social norms, cultural norms that create a framework of safe spaces for people to engage in very difficult conversations even offensive conversations to certain groups, to certain individuals in ways that maintain civility. And I, and I think we can do it because we've got the internet. <laughs> I think we can do it because we're an innovative nation. I think we can do it if we you know, engage and it's not something that's gonna happen tomorrow, but over time, I would like to see that happen. Nadine, I suspect that the term safe spaces concerns you a bit because of other meanings. The, the, the devil is all in the details, right? And the original concept of safe space was exactly as, as Isa has described it, um, right. one where there can be the most robust and candid free speech uh, and, and expression of very diverse and divergent points of view where people knew they would be safe from all the kinds of retaliation that we've ta been talking about from physical violence to cancellation or shunning or shaming. And that concept of uh, space that is safe for that kind of free speech and, and discourse is a wonderful concept. Randy? Um, I think it's interesting that uh, Nadine's comment, what, what her comment shows is the way in which terms are so malleable. Of course. Because frankly, I had, when I hear the term safe space, it has a very negative connotation because I think of it as, you know, um, uh, swept clean of controversy, swept clean of contestation. I think of it as a very bad thing. What she just said is it doesn't have to be that way. You could flip it. You could say, no, a safe space is a place where one can very safely enter into contestation, enter into debate, enter into, you know, the things that we want. I and just so, thought of, sorry. No, no, so I mean, it, it, it just goes to show you how we have to be really careful with terms and be really careful about defining exactly what we're saying and, you know, making clear what we mean. With one preposition that makes all the difference. A lot of people today use the term to define, to refer to safety from ideas, but what mm -hmm. and I are saying is safety for ideas. Yes, yes, absolutely. You know, in, in a job I held until relatively recently, when I arrived there outside my office, there was a 
a sticker of some sort that said, this is a safe space. And I thought this was a wonderful idea. I thought it was just a, a great concept. Yes, I would like people to regard my office as a leader, as a safe space to talk about anything. Well, you can imagine how contested that, that label became. And uh, I think we finally just sort of in the darkness of the night took the label off rather than continue engaging in that dialogue. All I can say is that I hope this country can arrive at a place can, can, that enough can calm down, that we can have that kind of conversation, whether we call it in a safe space or not. It just seems that there's an escalation of this, this anger and, and uh, that people welcome an incident like this as an opportunity to say non-constructive things and to be cruel to each other because that was the, that's what was theoretically protected in, in this spot. Uh, I, I wonder if anybody has any concluding words to say. I promised we'd finish at noon. Uh, and uh, I, I want to give each of the three of you an opportunity to make any concluding comments that occur to you growing out of the, the slap, as it will no doubt be known for, for some time. Nadine, you first. I'd just like to thank you, Sandy and Isa and Randy for a stimulating conversation. I uh, must admit it exceeded my expectations in terms of uh, what I would learn and hopefully what the audience will learn. Randy. Um, thank you very much for the forum. On the question, I, for, for a number of days, I thought, oh gosh, so much attention is being paid to this. Uh, and I, you know, I thought it was being overanalyzed, but actually I've, I've changed my mind. There's a lot that happened that I think is very useful to think about. And the fact that it was a slap, actually, that's right, violence, no, even a slap. We don't okay. want that. And I, I, I so right. I, I think there's a lot that actually happened that makes this a useful uh, pedagogical tool. So thank you very much for the conversation. Uh, I, I appreciate that. Uh, Issa, any, any quick parting words? Well, in addition to expressing my gratitude, I'm really happy to have been invited to this panel and thank you so much for having me. Um, I love that we're at a place where groups like the trans community that we talked about earlier can sort of amplify their voices by coming together to meet the, the, the level of uh, presence and the centering that somebody like Dave Chappelle has. Um, and I think that it's important to state out loud that groups that are coming from different perspectives and different points of view will hopefully use this as an opportunity. And I hope this is consistent with what Randall just said and with what Nadine just said, um, to come together and have really difficult conversations in ways that don't lead to harm against others that are restorative and that can begin to untangle all of the historical knots that have us connected to the sort of reflex violent response to being hurt or, uh, or, or uh, pained in some way. Andy, well, I just realized, could I possibly say 30 seconds because something really eerie just occurred to me. I'm speaking yes. from a hotel in Fort Worth prior to a speaking engagement here. And this is the hotel where John F. Kennedy spent what turned out to be his last night Right, and this is definitely relevant uh, because, of course, assassinating somebody, one of the worst acts of violence we can imagine, is expressing a point of view about a really important issue, namely political issues. So, you know, the, this is the, it's on a spectrum, right? The, the slap is way at the opposite end of the spectrum. And, you know, the January 6th is somewhere else on the spectrum. But that's what we're talking about. Somebody said that it was Sigmund Freud who allegedly said that, you know, civilization began when hurling words became a substitute for hurling rocks. And that's ultimately what we're talking about here. And that's certainly something we're, I think, all dedicated to. 
Um, I want to thank uh, Issa, uh, Randy Kennedy, Nadine Stross, and all of you for exactly the kind of conversation I hope we could have today. We do these quite often in the Free Speech Project, and I would invite people's attention to our website, Free Speech Project, all one word, dot Georgetown, dot edu. Uh, much more to be found there, including our Free Speech Tracker, which has almost 600 entries summarizing challenges to free speech and First Amendment values in, in this country. Thank you all, and please come back, give us, join our mailing list, and let us know that you want to be informed about what we're doing. Nadine, Randy, Issa, and all of those who tuned in, thank you very much. Thank you all very much. Thank you.